Well, good evening and welcome to Wednesdays in the Word, the weekly online study of the Bible hosted by Lebanon Rock Church. I'm Pastor Matt Skiles, and we want to welcome you to our teaching this evening for this Wednesday, February the 7th, 2024, as we will be completing our current lesson series on a new focus for a new year with lesson number six, as we will be talking about focusing on walking with God. So as always, I want to encourage you to make sure that you have brought either your Bible or your tablet or your smartphone, whatever your Bible app is that you're using, is going to be more than useful and more than helpful for tonight. And if you brought something to drink, Pastor Matt has his cup of coffee here, uh, which I will keep close by and uh, have with me as we go through. Now, I want to encourage everybody to make sure that you have your Bibles or your Bible apps with you because we are going to be covering a lot of scripture tonight, uh, touching on this topic of walking with God and how we need to focus on maintaining that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's ask God to bless our study this evening. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity that we have to come together in this online study and Lord begin to uh, not only focus on our relationship with you, but Lord, on having a closer walk with you. Father, we thank you for all those that are joining with us here online as we study this lesson tonight, and we pray that you will give your word free course in our hearts and in our lives. Father, we ask that you'll bless our in-person study tonight, as well as those joining with us online. We pray that you'll meet all the needs that we have in the body of Christ. Lord, we pray that you'll minister to hearts and lives. And Lord, help us to always remember that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Father, we pray now that you will just uh, cover this precious study that we have now in the blood of Jesus Christ. Forgive us of our sins, for they are many, as we forgive those who sins and sin and trespass against us. And Lord, bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, go with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. We're in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses 1, 2, and 3 as we start. And then we will be uh, staying in the book of Ephesians, but we will also be jumping over as well to some other verses of Scripture in Romans, Galatians, and the Gospel of John. So we've got a lot to cover here tonight, but we are going to focus tonight on walking with God. Ephesians 4, 1, 2, and 3, Paul gives these instructions to the Ephesian church. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, Paul tells us there that we are to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Speaks there of living out our life and, and having a strong, close, deep, intimate relationship or walk with the Lord. And walking in step with God really means that we maintain an intimate, close fellowship with our Heavenly Father. And a close relationship with him brings us joy, peace, contentment, and purpose. When we walk in step with the Lord, other people see him through our own lives. And that's how we make an impact on the kingdom of God uh, to this world. And how we can not only share the, the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ with others, but we also can experience the goodness of God in our own life. And so the first point, we've only got two points here tonight, but we want to focus on this. What does it mean to walk with God? What does it mean? Paul said there in Ephesians 4 and verse 1, 2, and 3, he said again, if we look at it again, he said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Paul's commanding us in encouraging us, admonishing us, whatever word you want to use there, to walk worthy of the calling. Now, we're all called to be disciples. We're all called to the Great Commission. We're all called to share the good news of the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. But what does it mean when we walk with God? Well, in Scripture, this phrase or term, walk with God, describes the lives of righteous people who have an intimate friendship, relationship with God, characterized by God's divine guidance through the Holy Spirit. And, and God calls every person to four things. God calls us to four things. First of all, he calls us to salvation, number one, from sin and death. Faith in Christ brings forgiveness and eternal life. You must be born again. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Secondly, number two, we're called to sanctification. That's a lifelong process of maturing and increasing in righteousness. Number three, thirdly, we are called to service in some fashion throughout our life. We're called to serve God. We're called to follow him and serve others. Jesus told us that the Son of, Son of Man came not to, to be served, but to serve. Jesus illustrated this when he washed his disciples' feet. He asks us to serve others, as actually, as the Bible tells us, we are to serve one another in love. And also, fourthly, fourthly, we're called to accountability for both our wise choices and our foolish and bad choices. We, we are held accountable for that. You know, Galatians makes it very clear in the word of God that God is not mocked for whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. So we reap what we sow and we're held accountable for our actions. So when we talk about what does it mean to walk with God, it means there that we are, are, are living out this life of faith righteously. We have this intimate relationship with God, and we let him guide us because we are called to do those four things. So what defines a worthy Christian walk? Well, we faithfully read the Word of God, study the Bible, we obey God, we believe his promises, and in our daily lives, we exhibit characteristics like love, wisdom, faith, integrity and transparency. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, if you're in Ephesians 4, just go over, if you would, to the next chapter in Ephesians 5, and we're going to read verses 15 and 16, and also we're going to read verse 1 and verse 2, but I want to look at verse 15 and 16 first, and then we'll, then we'll glance up to Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 15 and 16, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. He's telling us there that we need to walk in a manner that is not foolish, but is wise. And that circumspectly means we walk with reverence and trust in God, but we're mindful of how we live our life. Now let's glance up a couple of verses. Ephesians 5, look at verse number 1 and verse number 2. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So it says there we're to be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. So we have to walk in the same manner that Christ walked. When you see that there where it says, see them that, you know, it says be imitators of God as dear children. It's much like what you would see when a, a child is little I, uh, I remember my son, Bryce, when he was about four or five, maybe maybe four or five years old. Um, he wanted to, uh, he saw me shaving one day, and so he wanted to imitate his dad in the bathtub. Well, I'm not going to give my six-year-old son a Bic razor to shave with. So what I did was, is uh, I had a, a particular razor blade that had 
uh, it had a guard that went on it. And so I just took the blade off and put the, put the guard on it. And I showed my son how to shave and he put soap. He had soap on his face and he started to shave. What was my son doing? He was imitating me. Why did my son imitate me? Because he loves me and he wants to be like his dad. And um, if you ask him today now at 22 years of age, my son would say, I'm not going to be a pastor like my dad. Uh, but he loves God and he knows the Lord, but he certainly wouldn't do that. But when kids are little as dear children and as kids are growing up, they want to be like their parent, if, especially if they come from a good home and their parents love them and they see qualities in their parents that they love. They want to, they want to do that. And uh, my son now knows how to shave and he knows how to, you know, uh, use a razor and so on and so forth. But as a little boy, he was imitating me. He was imitating me. That's what Paul is likening this scripture here to. We love God. We're going to imitate him. We're going to imitate those characteristics and those qualities that make God special, that make our relationship with God special. And that's what we should do. Also, we, we want to point out, too, that the Christian believer is to walk in, in the light of truth and not be a partaker of the kingdom of darkness. If you're there in Ephesians 5, let's look at verse 3 through 8. And notice what Paul writes there. If you're in Ephesians 5, we just read verse 1 and 2. Let's read verse 3 through 8. It says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedient. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. So Paul is telling us here, this is what it means to walk with God. You, you imitate God. You take, uh, you take your cue and you take your, your guidance from God's word. We try to imitate God as the Bible tells us in, in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Paul says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma or savor. Well, then he goes on in verse 3 through 8 and says, this is how we are to walk. And he says, but these things that I just that we just read, they should not be found. If you're imitating, if you're imitating God, you're not going to do these things that are very present in a carnal mind and in a carnal sinful world. And that's where we understand what it means to walk with God. You walk with God, you stay close to God, you maintain that relationship with him, and you're led by the Holy Spirit, but you do not engage in the things that you see happening in the world today. Just because we are in the world, that doesn't mean we have to be of the world. We choose to walk with God, and we imitate him. We demonstrate his love. We demonstrate his forgiveness. We, we show compassion and grace and mercy. And what we're seeing here in the world today is a lot of Christians that claim to be Christians, but they're not really walking and fleshing out their faith. It's like the old cliche you hear in a lot of churches. If you're going to talk the talk, then you have to walk the walk. Well, you know, it's important to remember that if you're going to flesh out and, and, and live out the faith you profess, it has to be seen. It has to be seen in the life that you live. And that is only seen when you walk with God. So we looked at point number one. What does it mean to walk with God? Now let's look at our second point, point number two. How do we walk in step with God? How do we walk in step with God? Because we're walking with God every day of our life. From the moment we wake up until the moment we lay our head to rest, throughout that 24-hour period of time that we're given 
on this earth, that day that God blesses us with, God's with us. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's watching over us. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro on the earth. He sees the good. He sees the bad. Our job as Christians is to understand how we walk in step with God each and every day. This is not something you just do on Sunday or on Wednesday in the midweek or you know, whenever you have a crisis or a problem in your life. I don't ever want to be like the disciples that were on the Emmaus Road, that after Jesus had risen from the grave and they departed from Jerusalem and were on their way to Emmaus, as they're walking to Emmaus, they encounter Jesus. Now, they don't know who he is. They're walking with him all this time. They do not know who it is they're walking with. Now, obviously, their eyes had been veiled the scales fell off their eyes once they stopped to break bread and eat, and then Jesus disappeared from their presence. And they ran all the way back to tell the other disciples what they had witnessed. Well, the illustration and the application of that story is that they walked a couple of miles with Jesus, several miles with Jesus. And as they walked and talked, they did not even recognize who it was they were walking with. A lot of Christians are like that. They claim to have faith in God. They claim to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They claim to have been born again and saved and, and, and on their way to heaven. But by their life and by the way that they walk each day, you would not know that. Because they talk as though they know the Lord. But in reality, they really don't live out the life they profess. That's why it's so important to hear the words Jesus said in, 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 in the gospel of Matthew when he said, on that day, he'll say to, to many, depart from me, you who work iniquity, for I never knew you. That term, never knew you, is, is, is the Lord Jesus saying, I did not know you intimately. I did not know you. You did not know me. And that's really sad. It's really sad. You know, one of the things I find remarkable is, is when I talk with couples or I talk with people that go through problems in their life, and especially when I'm dealing with married couples, and I've had some people tell me that they were getting divorced or that they were going through a, a difficult period in their marriage. And many spouses will say about the other, I didn't know who I married. <clears throat> I remember one young woman got married and she came to me later and said, I, I didn't have any idea. I had no, I didn't even know this man. I didn't know he was like this. Had another man that, that married a young woman in my first church in Michigan. And about nine months later, I sat down with both of them and um, was talking with them. And uh, this young lady did not divulge to her husband some of the abuse and past trauma that she had experienced. And he said, I thought I knew her, Pastor Skiles but I don't. It caused a great deal of problem and difficulty for their marriage. Um, one that was unexpected, but yet still had to be addressed. That comes back to a lack of knowledge. And the Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. When we don't know the Lord, how can we walk with him? It's just like the scripture asks in the book of Amos, how can any two walk lest they be agreed? How can you walk with the Lord if you don't know him? So the second point today and this evening's study is how do we walk in step with God? Well, first of all, it takes surrender. That means wholly submitting to God, and that ensures our ability to walk with him consistently. Let's go to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12, we're going to read verse 1 and 2. And notice what the Apostle Paul is writing here. And uh, Paul's writings and letters to the church are just amazing because they 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 definitely definitely um, speak to the modern day church as well as they did of the church in Paul's day. Romans twelve, verse one and two. He writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And he says in verse two, and be not conformed to this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, you know, Paul is saying here, I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. He is calling us. He is calling us, encouraging us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. That means we surrender our lives sacrificially to the Lord and say, Lord, take my life and Lord, I'm yours. So we have to surrender and submit to God. And that's what Paul is saying here. You, 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 as it, you present your body a living sacrifice. You willingly give of your life. You willingly say, I'll follow you. And that's important because a living sacrifice is a life that is surrendered to God. Let's go now to Galatians 2 and verse 20. Let's go to Galatians 2 and verse 20. Galatians 2 and 20. One of my favorite, favorite verses of scripture in the Bible. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I've shared it before teaching on Wednesday in the Word, but I want to come back and, and say it again so I can share that with you. Galatians 2 and verse 20. And let's look at what the Apostle Paul says. Powerful testimony here. He says these words. I have been crucified with Christ. It is, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He goes on and says in verse 21, these words, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Paul saying, I, I don't test or frustrate or challenge the grace of God. I don't set that aside. Because if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Paul knows what it cost Jesus. So Paul saying, I am crucified with Christ. He's saying, Paul is dead. And the man that lives now in this human body is a man that lives by faith in the Son of God. He has died to self. So we have to surrender if we're going to walk in step with God. It takes surrender. Secondly, if we're going to walk in step with God, it takes sensitivity. It takes sensitivity. Listening to the Lord, listening to the Lord is a vital part of enjoying intimate fellowship with him throughout the day. So let's go to the Gospel of John chapter 8. Gospel of John chapter 8. And here we see Jesus speaking here on the importance of listening. I remember years ago, I remember years ago, I went to a pastoral prayer conference in 2000. And um, I remember, I remember that um, the, uh, the, the conference speaker there was a wonderful man from Oklahoma. And I remember the theme that he shared was on having a hearing heart, having a hearing heart. I never, ever forgot that. And um, my prayer during that time of prayer and fasting, during that period of time, was for God to give me a hearing heart. And um, because if we're going to walk in step with God, you have to be sensitive. You have to be sensitive. And there has to be a sensitivity there. You've got to be in tune with what God is saying. So let's look at John chapter 8. We're going to read verse 28 and 29. And let's see what the Lord says here. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself but as my Father taught me. I speak these things. Verse 29. And He who sent me is with me, the Father has not left me alone, 
for I always do those things that please him. Jesus was speaking here of how he was in tune with his heavenly father. Look at it again. He said, I always do those things that please him. Jesus is saying, I'm not doing my own will, but the will of my father who sent me. Jesus also was quoted in a scripture saying, I come to do your will, O God. The Lord was in tune with what his heavenly father was telling him. Jesus was sensitive to what his father told him. Jesus was led by the spirit. How do you, how do I know that? How do we know that? Because after Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, he was immediately driven by the spirit into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and later was tempted of, of, the, of, of, of Satan, the enemy who tempted him three times. When Jesus said in John chapter 4, I must go through Samaria, he was following the leading of his Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus was sensitive to the will of his Father and whatever his Father uh, directed him and told him to do because he said, he who sent me is with me. Jesus always did the things that please God. So now he gets it down to a personal level with us. Let's go to John chapter 10. Just jump a couple of chapters to John chapter 10. And let's look at verse number four. And then we're going to jump down uh, to verse number 27. John chapter 10, verse number four. Look at what the Lord Jesus says. Jesus says in verse four, and when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Now let's jump to verse number 27. Let's look at verse number 27. And Jesus said these words in verse number 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Let me read that again. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now, if you've ever been to Israel or, the, or you've been over to the Holy Land, I have not had the privilege of doing that yet, but my brother has been there a couple of times and I've had other pastors that have gone there. And um, I remember a story that I heard uh, from a preacher that had been there, not my brother, but uh, but my brother did verify that there were shepherds and flocks and herds that were there uh, in the land of Israel, in the Holy Land. And one pastor shared where he was in Israel, and they were walking on a tour, and he saw a man that had a flock of, of sheep and another man that had a flock of sheep, and they were bringing them to a watering well. And as the sheep gathered in around the watering well, they all began to drink of the water. It was a very hot day, and, uh, and the sun was, was rather hot. It was a very, very hot and dry day. And so the shepherds were just conversing amongst themselves. And then once all the sheep had been, had been able to get a drink and had been able to you know, go to the watering hole, it was just a, a, like a watering hole with water. It wasn't anything else. The one shepherd went in one direction and the other shepherd went down, down a path in another direction. And the first shepherd whistled or made a sound and every sheep that was in his flock followed him and went that way. And the other shepherd, he said a word or gave a voice or shouted with his voice and the rest of them. And you know what? Not a single sheep or lamb was lost. You know why? Because the shepherd that was there called his sheep, and those sheep recognized the voice of the shepherd. Jesus was using a practical analogy, a practical example here, a real-life example of how just like a shepherd can have a hundred sheep and could go and intermingle with another flock of sheep, but as soon as he whistled, as soon as he made a sound or, or uttered something from his voice, the sheep would follow him because the sheep knew his voice. And, and that is amazing to think about, that sheep are that in tune to the voice of the shepherd that they will not get lost because that shepherd is the one that leads them, protects them, feeds them, guides them, 
Um, you know, and that's why it's so important that when Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, he's speaking there of you and I as believers. We walk with the Lord because we recognize and hear his voice. And there has to be a sense, a sensitivity to that because the ability to hear the voice of the Lord is absolutely essential in the Christian life. And, and, and we know his voice and we recognize his voice, not because we're super, because we're, we're super special, but because we are in tune with the leading of the Holy Spirit and we know the voice of the Lord. And um, that's important. We have to be sensitive, sensitive. Thirdly, how do we walk in step with God? Thirdly, we do that by studying, by learning the biblical principles, we discover what pleases the Lord. And what are the right attitudes and actions that we that 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 we need to uh, portray? And what are the wrong actions and the wrong attitudes that we need to avoid? This word right here, God's word right here, is everything we need. We have to study to show ourselves approved, as the Scripture says. We have to get the word of God into our hearts and into our spirits. And, 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 and that's why Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you study the word and you spend time learning biblical truths and biblical principles, it will help you grow. That's why Romans 10 and 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more of God's words you put in your heart, the, the closer and deeper you're going to, to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll have a greater understanding. So let's look at Colossians 3 and 16. Go to Colossians 3, 16. And uh, we'll, read, we'll read what the Apostle Paul writes here to the church of Coloss. Colossians 3 and 16. Colossians 3 and 16. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. He says, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it settle into your heart. Let it find a resting place, as my favorite preacher, Bert Clendenin, used to say. We have to do that. It's not just reading the Bible and saying, well, I've got to check that off my to-do list today. Spend time reading the word. Let the word dwell in your heart, in your mind, in your thoughts. And truly, 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 uh, let that word minister to you. That's how we grow and that's how we're blessed. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 17 to 18. Again, we, we already... Um, have been reading in Ephesians, so let's go back to let's go back to Ephesians again, Ephesians four, and verse number seventeen, and this is where Paul is writing here, Ephesians four and seventeen. Ephesians four and seventeen says, "This I say then and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated." from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. You think about that. Why Why are they, you know, why does it say there that, that they are, notice again, look at verse number 18. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Now, you know, that, that basically means that people are spiritually blind and they don't understand, you know, how futile it is to have, the, to have a carnal mindset. Uh, Book of Romans chapter 8 I believe it's verse 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Ephesus, the, the, the city that Paul sent this letter to, was a morally corrupt city. 
And many of the Gentiles there were enlightened in philosophy and all kinds of, 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 of thought and, and philosophy and thinking was being debated and, and people were trying to uh, discuss all forms of, of enlightenment. And Paul was saying, don't be like those people. You know, you notice that Paul, Paul speaks about the futility of their mind, having their understanding dark, and that means they don't understand. They don't understand. They're alienated from life, from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. A lot of people today that are in our world today are intelligent people, educated people. But I dare say that, that their understanding is darkened and they're being alienated. If you need any indication, just look at how corrupt our culture is right now. People do not understand biblical principles. The Bible makes it very clear. I heard uh, Bishop uh, Patrick Wooden, who's a wonderful pastor in the Carolinas, and I listen to him from time to time. Wonderful, wonderful brother in Christ. Uh, and uh, he mentions and preached a message titled, God Made Them Male and Female. There I said it. Wonderful message. And what Bishop Wooden said was that, that God created the male gender and the female gender. He created the human body. He created humanity, just like he created every other, uh, every other animal and every other bird, every other fish in marine life. He said all the, all the, all the animal life and marine life on this earth, God created it. And God has always made them male and female. And yet we live in a culture today where people say there's multiple genders. People are born either a male or female, but yet they identify. And, 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 and I'll be, and I hate to burst the bubble, but if you're born with an XY chromosome or an XX chromosome, that doesn't change even if you, even if you have your body cut on and you have your body surgically altered, that does not change the genetic code that God put in you, and it doesn't change that you are either a male or female by birth, and that is how you are. DNA does not lie. Unfortunately, uh, we don't teach that or preach that as much as we should, and that's why there's so much confusion. When very clearly the Bible says that we are not to walk as the Gentiles walk. In this case, it would be do not walk as the world walks. Just because the world and our culture and the media and Hollywood and, 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 and everything else in, in the entertainment sector and in our world says one thing, God's word says something else. And God is the final judge on that. And that's never going to change. And so we see that we have to be studying. We need to be in the word of God every day. Fourth area where we, where we walk and step with God is through supplication. That's prayer. Enthusiastic, specific prayer is vital to walking with God. Jesus often withdrew to pray alone in the early morning hours. Mark 1 and 35 it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. Jesus made prayer a vital part of his life. It was of utmost importance to him. And it should be to us as well. It should be, um, it should be the most important part of our Christian life. Because nothing determines your attitude more towards God than by how much you pray. Colossians 4 and verse 2, Paul tells us, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So we have to continue earnestly in prayer. That means make a concerted effort to pray every day. And as I say this before, not something sloppy like, Lord, I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I'm not talking about a little children's prayer or an ABC prayer. I'm talking about an earnest conversation and communion with God, spending time in prayer, talking to God, listening to God, letting God speak to you by the Holy Spirit, through his word. You know, Moses prayed to God and talked to God like he was a friend. When I pray, sometimes I walk and talk. Sometimes I sit. Sometimes I kneel. Sometimes I lay on my face before God. But I'm praying. When I go to prayer, it's important to me because, I'm, because you, are, you are connecting yourself with the throne of heaven. And you are beginning to 
talk to the God of this universe. That is an awesome, awesome privilege that we have. So, so walking in step with God, how do we do that? We do that by supplication. We do that by supplication. And as Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You discover God's peace. You discover God's presence. You discover, uh, you discover the peace of God that he can give you when you go to God in prayer. And we see the fifth way. How do we walk in step with God? The fifth way we do that is through self-denial. Self-denial. Now, self-denial means we die to the flesh and the temptations of this world and allow Christ to live through us. This goes hand in hand with surrender. Galatians 2 and 20, which we read a moment ago, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now that means that Paul has died to self. He's denied himself and he has decided to follow Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul was a living sacrifice throughout his life. And then we see scriptures where Jesus talked about taking up our cross, denying ourself and following him. Matthew 16 and 24 reads, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We look at Mark 8 and 34. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples, he said to them, here it is again, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What do we do? We, we have to deny ourselves and take up the cross. Luke 9 and 23, same words, almost word for word. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. If you're going to walk with the Lord, it takes self-denial. You've got to deny self. The hardest person that we have to deal with on an everyday basis is ourself. God wants us to deny ourself. He wants us to surrender. So surrendering to God and denying self, they go hand in hand. Um, I always like to say that, that surrender and denying self and surrendering to God or surrendering to God and denying ourselves is like peanut butter and jelly spaghetti and meatballs, you know, bacon and eggs. It goes together. You can't have one. You have to have them both because they both, they both run concurrent. There is a symmetry there to that. You deny yourself and you deny yourself, you're going to easily surrender to what God wants you to do and what the Lord wants you to do. And a good example of this too is found in Mark 10 and 21. Jesus was approached by a rich young ruler who came to him and said he would follow him. And Jesus, of course, mentions the commandments. And the young man said, all these I have done since my youth. But look at Mark 10, 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Jesus was speaking to the rich young ruler with a heart of love, with a desire to earnestly impact and change this young man's life. And he said, one thing, one thing, just one thing you lack. And that was going to take self-denial. It was going to take that rich young ruler selling everything that he owned, giving it to the poor, and then following Jesus. And it was going to be an act of self-denial that was going to require a lot of him. It was only one thing, but it was going to be a major thing. 
Sometimes God is asking us to deny self, and there are things we don't want to give up, whether it's riches, wealth, possessions. Uh, I've seen people called to the ministry, called to the ministry. God has put a calling on their life. God has a purpose and a plan for their life. But you know what? They're locked into a high-paying job. Uh, they've got a beautiful home. They've got a comfortable life. And they're not going to give everything to God. They're not going to give everything. They've counted the cost and it's too much. And so they won't fully surrender to God because they can't fully deny self. And I'm not trying to prop myself up here or give myself points. That's not what I'm trying to do. But when God called me to the ministry, it took me from my home state of Missouri and my family and friends and, and a community that I was very comfortable in. And it took me to California. And I spent three years in California. You talk about a fish out of water. That was me. I was a stranger in a strange land. And yet God wanted me there so I could grow, I could mature, I could become uh, a better, not only not only a better uh, servant of God, but I could also develop into the, into the preacher, into the minister, the pastor that God was wanting me to be. God was working in my life. I don't know where I'd be. I can only imagine where I'd be if I had not denied self and said, I'll go, Lord. And then it was time to leave California. I had to once again make that choice and surrender to the will of God and said, Lord, if you're calling me away from pastoral ministry and I'm going to be an evangelist, the Lord said, go, and I went. And that started a three-year odyssey, and I traveled and preached and ministered. And, and then God moved me to back into pastoral ministry shortly after I met my wife. And God took me to the state of Michigan, to a place I never thought I'd go. And there I, there I was. Sometimes whenever you are walking in step with God, you have to deny self, even though it's not comfortable, it's not easy, it's not what you want, it's what God wants. It's what God wants. And sometimes we have to humble ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. I'm crucified with Christ, is what Paul said. Nevertheless, I live, but Christ lives in me. We are, we are dead to the old life. We are dead to that old life. On August the 28th, 1990, I came to the Lord Jesus Christ and accepted him as my Savior. The old Matt died, and a new Matt emerged. I'm still working and growing and maturing. I'm still seeking to become what God wants me to be, but, but that requires self-denial. That requires self-denial. And the last, the last one, number six, the sixth way that we walk in step with God is service. Jesus gave of himself by healing, befriending, meeting the needs of others, preaching and teaching, and ultimately by dying on the cross for the sins of the world. In Mark 10 and verse number 45 Jesus sums it up with these words, for, the, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, Jesus said to us, the servant is not greater than his Lord. The servant's not greater than their master. So if Jesus served, and Jesus demonstrated a servant's heart, we have to have the same thing. Our intimacy with the Lord naturally will result in a closer walk with the Lord and a deeper desire to serve him and serve others. Sometimes I don't like doing what I have to do as a pastor. Sometimes pastoral work gets a little messy. Things get sideways. There's stress, there's anxiety, and there's a whole lot of frustration. But yet God's called me to be a servant. God's called me to serve. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. He gives us that, that example that we are to follow as well. So in conclusion, I submit to you that a, a, a deeper, closer, more intimate experience with God begins when you walk in step with Jesus. Peace, joy, contentment, confidence, comfort, and direction that belongs to us when you obediently submit your life to him. 
Nothing, and I promise you, nothing is more fulfilling than knowing God and accomplishing his will, his plan in your life. But that comes from walking with God and focusing on our walk each and every day. So let us purpose to do that this year, that we'll focus on walking with God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson, for the opportunity that we've had to talk about this great topic of walking with you. Father, help us to have a deeper, closer, more intimate walk with you each and every day of our life. Lord, if we're not praying like we should, help us to have a deeper, closer prayer life. Lord, if we're not in the Word of God studying to show ourselves approved, then Lord, help us to have a greater desire for the Word of God. Father, we pray that you'll draw us closer to you. Lord, as we draw near to you, you will draw near unto us. Help us, Father, as we move through the rest of 2024, that we will refocus, recalibrate our priorities and our focus on you. And we'll be looking unto you, Lord Jesus, as the author and the finisher of our faith. Help us to walk, not as fools, but to walk wise, to walk holy, and to walk worthy. I bless us, Father, we pray as we conclude this series. Bring us back next week as we start a brand new study series. And bring us back Sunday as we uh, continue and conclude our current sermon series on looking unto Jesus. So bless us, Father, prosper us and keep us in health, even as our souls prosper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you, and thank you for joining with me tonight, and we thank you for being a part of this weekly online study of the Word of God. We will be beginning a brand new series of study next week, so be sure you join us uh, next week for that, and we're looking forward to a great time in the Lord. So from all of us here at Lebanon Rock Church, we say thank you for joining with us. God bless you. Have a great rest of your week, and we look forward to having you back with us next time.